I am Lerna Ekmekçioğlu. I am the Macmillan Stewart uh, Chair in Women in the Developing World, uh, which is based in the Women and Gender Studies program. But I am a historian uh, of the modern Middle East, and I organize these once a semester lectures on any topic that pertains to women in the developing world. Um, I will be introducing our guest uh, shortly, but before that I wanted to uh, uh, alert you to our next event, which we already planned. It is on September 12th, uh, room we don't know yet, but <laughs> Dr. Hala Aldosari, who is a Saudi, who is going to be joining MIT this June as the Robert E. Wilhelm Fellow, um, but she is right now the Washington Post um, uh, Fellow, Jamal Khashoggi Fellow. She's a Saudi. She's from Saudi Arabia. She's a Saudi Arabian woman activist and a physician whose work is about sexual violence against women in Saudi Arabia, and uh, it's its economic and social effects. Okay, so it's September 12th, and it is part of this overall conversation of actually making topics related to Saudi Arabia more prominent on this campus. Okay, so we are very grateful today. It is really a pleasure to have you here, Dr. Zahra Ali, uh, who is a, an assistant professor of sociology at the Sociology and Anthropology Department at Rutgers University. She is. She has French uh, training. Uh, a lot of her publications are also French. That's why I will not read all of them. Plenty, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. But she got her uh, PhD from EHSS uh, in sociology uh, in 2015, and she also did this European PhD label uh, in gender studies at the SOAS. In general, her research explores dynamics of women and gender, social and political moments in relation to Islam and Islam, the Middle East, and the context of war and conflict with a focus on contemporary Iraq. Uh, her first book she published in 2012 as a graduate, well, she was a graduate student, I think, and it is an edited volume, volume in French but it's also uh, translated and published in German. The volume is called Feminism Islamic, and it's about transnational Islamic Muslim feminisms through a post-colonial and intersectional feminist perspective, and it analyzes the interrelationship between race, gender, religion, and post-coloniality. Uh, she is a sociologist, but very much of a qualitative sociologist, which yes. is different from more like American way of doing sociology, more in this mm -hmm. European sense. But I am, I'll talk about this book, I'm in the process of reading, but one would get that she's a historical sociologist and an anthropologist, mm -hmm. really, because she has been doing ethnography in the region for a long time, in the region meaning both Iraq as well as the diaspora, Arab diaspora, Muslim diaspora, mm -hmm. I think, in France especially amongst women's groups and feminists in general. Her second book is another co-edited co volume uh, for a special issue of the Journal of Muslims in Europe titled Mapping Shiite, Shiite Muslim Communities in Europe, Local and Transnational Dimensions, which came out from Brill in 2017. The same year she also published another co-edited volume. I'm not reading the names of your co-editors here, because there are a number of them. Uh, this one is in French. It is called Pluriversalism Decolonial. Mm -hmm. uh, and it explores, it has this more theoretical and comparative uh, focus. It explores decolonial theories reflecting on non eurocentric and epistemologies, aesthetics, political thoughts, and activisms. And this volume uh, is comparative as in the sense that it draws on Latin American and Caribbean philosophies, concepts of, concepts of creolization and racial, racialization, and explores uh, Afropean aesthetics as well, arts and cultural productions. Okay, but what brings her today is to our campus is this book, which came out from uh, Cambridge University Press in 2018. A few months ago, mm -hmm. yes, yeah. that's for it's really a very good it's a treat for us, titled Women and Gender in Iraq Between Nation Building and Fragmentation. And 
the talk will be based on this work, so I will not be talking about the content of the book, but I will note that I, I do teach women and gender in the Middle East and North Africa here, and I also teach women and war, and I really find a book of this um, quality and composition rather, because in the book, which, and she's very kind enough, because she's going to be, Dr. Ali will be visiting my class, uh, which is called Gender, uh, this Friday, so we'll have a chance to discuss the book with the students as well, but the, um, to me, I've read half of it, <laughs> but it is the, this combination of historic, vigorous historical and political analysis, long durée almost, for mm. any anthropologists and sociologists, it would be considered long durée when you started 100 years ago, <laughs> but then including uh, inserting uh, oral history interview that Dr. Ali uh, conducted with Iraqi women on the ground now living in Iraq, and how they remembered those years. So it makes for just, I think it's a very good balance of both accessible, will be accessible to students, there's this personal narrative, but also not just accessible, but very gratifying, historically and theoretically for us. So thank you thank for you. the book and for being here. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jan. Because the book, I mean... I would say it just came out just a few months ago. It's, it's so important for, for me to get that kind of feedback. Thank you so much. Um, and thank you so much. For, uh, like I'm very grateful to the Women and Gender uh, Studies Center, uh, to uh, Sophia and Emily, and to you uh, for organizing this event. It's a real pleasure for me to be here. It's my first time at MIT. <laughs> so I'm very new as well to the US context because uh, I'm you know, French educated. I've been around the UK. I've been uh, in Iraq as well, uh, um, in France. Uh, um, and it's been a year and a half that I, uh, I, I I've been living in the US. So I started my position at Rutgers in September 2017. So I'm still discovering the, the, the American academic context. Um, so um, it's, it's, I'm going to talk for something like one hour, uh, which is long, I know. <laughs> I tend to lose focus after 20 minutes. So I'm, I'm going to you know, try to think about that and, and you know, speak in a way that, you know, uh, I mean, uh, um, I hope you won't, you won't get bored, basically. So uh, what I will do today is uh, tell you a little bit about the way I started working on uh, women, gender, and feminisms in Iraq, and, and tell you about the way I also situate myself theoretically, the way I frame my research questions, um, and then I think I'll give you a brief histor historical overview uh, on what is the core of my, of my project, uh, uh, the analysis of the relationship between issues of women, gender, uh, nation, state, and religion in contemporary Iraq. Uh, I'll focus a lot on the personal status code because I, I think that it says a lot about uh, you know, that kind of relationship. And I'll try to start, I mean, 100 years ago, I mean, very quickly, uh, you know, with the colonial per period because I think there are parallels to be done uh, between the British invasion and occupation of Iraq and the US uh, invasion and occupation of 2003. Um, so, uh, and also finally, because I'm recently back from Iraq, I spent uh, um, about uh, a month mainly in Baghdad. I spent, I, I mean, I, I didn't do only field work. I spent a lot of time in, with my family as well. But I did field work in the south of Iraq, Najaf, Kufa, Karbala, uh, Nasriya, and, and, and in Basra uh, just a little bit. So I will tell you a little bit about it and also I mean, for you basically to have some, some um, maybe knowledge, maybe, maybe you are following what's going on in the south of Iraq, but many things are going on at the moment. So I will, I will talk about it and I will talk about maybe the relationship between uh, the movement of protest that is going on and uh, feminist activism and issues of women and gender. Uh, so first of all, uh, um, I want to say that I started this intellectual journey as a feminist activist uh, with an observation regarding the realities of knowledge production on Iraq and especially on the current period. Um, so a few years ago when I started you know, uh, uh, my PhD, I noticed that the literature on Iraq has a predominant white man political scientist <laughs> lens that focuses on political regimes and leaders, on violence, uh, offering a very limited and limiting analysis. Uh, many recent research even makes it sound like everything started 
or ended or is about 2003, basically. So Iraq is often a thing, right, in the head of many authors, eager to talk about, I mean, sometimes to talk about imperialism, you know, uh, rightly, about war and occupation, about violence in the Middle East, but not necessarily interested in Iraqi society, in its complexity, in its diversity, in its contradictions. So on the one hand, you have a discourse and scholarship on Iraq that falls into essentialist views, describing it through ancestral violence. And on the other hand, uh, even among post-colonial work that you know, want to tackle Orientalism and, and refuse this essentialist assumption uh, on a so-called Iraqi culture, right, or Muslim culture. However, often within this scholarship, Iraq, Iraqis are essentially perceived and portrayed as victims of some outside forces. So I'm not saying that they are not, <laughs> but uh, I think that uh, Iraqi society can be approached and analyzed, cannot be approached and analyzed only through this limiting and, and you know, somehow essentializing lens. So I also noticed that the scholarship written by Iraqi intellectuals from the diaspora is often authored by the older generation. And more importantly, I think it's often disconnected from the realities about the social and political dynamics existing inside the countries, inside the country. So many Iraqis and non-Iraqis uh, talk about Iraq again as something very much in their mind uh, without being in touch, leaving or even having visited the country. So also what is produced inside Iraq uh, uh, for various reasons uh, that I'm going to talk about a little bit, I mean, including, of course, the very destruction of our education system in the 90s uh, uh, by the UN or slash US sanctions. Uh, this knowledge production lacks very much relational, critical approaches, and more importantly, feminist or even gender perspectives. So. Um, I also intended as well to provide a critical contribution to postcolonial and transnational feminist scholarship that really have shaped my thinking uh, throughout my personal, intellectual, and as well political journey. So I often say that uh, my book, so let me, uh, is as much about women, gender, and feminisms in Iraq that it is a feminist book about Iraq. Um, and in the book, what I'm trying to do is applying the personal is political feminist mantra, <laughs> not only in looking at what Iraqi women social and political activists say or think, but at the very concrete social, economic and political context that shape their discourse and activism. So because what I notice in many work tackling women and gender in postcolonial feminist literature is that there is an emphasis on discourses and representations, right? On, on discursive dimensions uh, of women and gender issues. And I quote uh, in my book, Denise Candioti, who says that many scholars approaching the, the, the region, the Middle East, uh, in postcolonial framework, uh, attempt, attempting to tackle Orientalism can also uh, be stuck in this binary thinking and focus on the West, right? Uh, and not enough on the internal heterogeneity of societies in the Middle East or Muslim majority countries. Uh, so uh, Denise Candioti also notes that social analysis and ethnography has been uh, devaluated in favor of an analysis of representations and discourses. And more, uh, I mean, moreover, I think that as exceptional Iraq is, right, uh, and its various forms of feminisms are, um, when we think of, of course, the incredible cycles of political, economic, and armed violence that we've been experiencing in Iraq <coughs> since the 80s. However, I think it should also be approached as any other social and political context. And it's a challenge, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so the first kind of uh, inspiration, maybe some of you who are into you know, post-colonial transnational feminist uh, scholarship are um, you know, familiar with it, or maybe uh, anthropologists. So the, the first kind of uh, inspiration for writing this book uh, and researching women, gender, and feminisms in Iraq more generally is uh, the writing against culture of Laila Abu Lohot, right? Um, the anthropologist Laila Abu Lohot. Uh, it echoed so much with my own reflection, the idea that we need to unpack what we mean by culture. Uh, that we need to look at the economic, social, and pol political dimensions of this so-called culture. And I insist uh, uh, in my work on the materiality of what is supposed to shape this you know, culture. Here, the idea, of course, is you know, not, I mean, to reject the use of Arab culture, Muslim culture, Middle Eastern, or whatever, or Middle Eastern patriarchy, you know, what, is, what does it mean to, to talk this way? 
So uh, um, the importance to tackle Orientalism and also self-Orientalism uh, among scholars and feminists. Uh, and I also put this reflection in dialogue with uh, Sami Zubaydah, an Iraqi scholar uh, based in London, Sami Zubaydah's work on Beyond Islam, uh, which not only says that we should not interpret or read social and political realities through the lens of an undifferentiated Islam, but also that we need to unpack through historicizing, contextualizing, through social analysis, the very use of Islam or Islamic. What makes something or anything Islamic, right? Uh, in this sense, I'm very critical of my initial work, you know, on Islamic or Muslim feminism. Not that I think that the categories are completely irrelevant, not at all, but um, I insist that we need to approach them critically. And something that I do, for example, with my students, in my, in my feminist, uh, uh, um, like uh, queer uh, transnational feminist classes or sociology of gender classes, is to ask them, every time they're using the word culture, to actually define what they, what they mean. So, you know, think about it, if you think about, I don't know, when, we, when, when you say street culture, or working class culture, or middle class culture, or Muslim culture, what do we mean exactly? What are we talking about? Uh, isn't culture something done, reproduced, challenged, right? Isn't it changing? Isn't it contradictory? Isn't it fluid? And um, it's interesting because uh, I often experience, so, uh, when I give talks or, le or lectures, uh, you know, I talk 45 minutes about the complexity of feminism and gender and, 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 and Iraqi society, etc. And most of the time, even in academic settings, I always have somebody uh, raising uh, his or, or her hand and saying, okay, uh, it's interesting what you're saying, but how is it in Islam exactly? <laughs> <laughs> and so first, most of the time I reply, well, Islam is not a country, you know, it's not a place, you know, in Islam. <laughs> so, and there isn't a book or a thing, right, called a sharia. It, it, it just doesn't exist. What are we talking about? You know, in the same way, what are we talking about when, when we say culture? Are we talking about a middle class, suburban, you know, religious rituals performed by individuals in, in certain places? Are we talking about Sunni Islam, Shia Islam? What branches within these Islams are we, you know, talking about? Uh, and are we talking about the way it is experienced or the way it has been institutionalized, right? So I try to complicate uh, the, the debates uh, on words such as Islamic, Muslim, Islamist as well uh, uh, in the book. And um, uh, among the many things that I'm trying to challenge uh, uh, is to question certain dichotomies and assumed uh, oppositions such as the secular versus the religious. Especially when it comes to women's rights and gender issues, I think, I mean, it's very central. Um, and um, what I try to show in the book is that the so-called secular and, or, or Islamist activisms are diverse, intertwined, and that often these terms are not relevant to actually make sense of a political activism. I argue that when we contextualize and historicize different forms of women's social and political activisms and feminism, the use of different registers of rights, imaginaries, uh, frames of reference on notions of justice, dignity, equality are imbricated and can't fall into a secular or a religious category. And I'm also challenging the, the secular religious binary through transnational feminist critique that argues that we need not only to apply a relational or an intersectional approach in imbricating is issues of gender with class, ethnicity, religion, sect, kinship, etc., different forms of belonging, but also that we need to keep in mind and analyze the ways the categories themselves are fluid and changing. So what I'm trying to do in this research is to analyze, uh, in the book, is to analyze how the imbrication between issues of nationhood, nationalisms, I mean, various ideas of, of nation and nationhood, state politic, religions, and gender are played, articulated, intertwined in different periods of time. So from the, f the formulation of what we call, you know, the woman question or qadriyat al mar'a in the early post-colonial period to today, what are the terms of these imbrications in 
the early Iraqi Republic under the Ba'ath regime uh, in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s, and then after 2003. And my research tackles, the, uh, I mean, my recent research, the, the most recent fieldwork that I've done also tackled, uh, tackled the, the period following the invasion of Daesh uh, in June uh, 2014. I think that uh, new dynamics have uh, emerged since this period, and, 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 I, and I'll talk about it at the, at the end. That also leads me to, uh, um, you know, transnational feminist uh, uh, analysis. The choice of the trans, you notice that it's not international feminist analysis, it's transnational. So why do, do we, we choose to the trans instead of the inter? Uh, first, I think it reflects the need to destabilize rather than maintain boundaries of nation, race, gender, etc. And it's also a criticism of a so-called global feminism supposed uh, uh, to gather all women together. And then in reality, often rely on a very Eurocentric, a very middle class, a very neoliberal notion of solidarity to define what you know, what a woman of the world are supposed to need and want. And also you notice the national and transnational uh, because uh, transnational feminist scholarship really focus on this, uh, uh, on you know, nation state building in post-colonial context and the way it is deeply gendered, it has been deeply gendered. And the way it also interacts with global capitalism central to a transnational feminist approach is to recognize the link between women through racialized global capitalism rather than through an abstract notion of womanhood or sisterhood. Uh, so we look at nation building processes uh, and we show how nation and di diverse forms of nationalisms are often defined in essentialist and exclusivist terms and rely on, on male dominated and on some context militaristic notion, uh, definition of citizenship that you know, fix gender roles and identities. And, and I'll talk about it when I'll talk about the, you know, militarization in Iraq. And the way, you know, also nation, national, I talk about it a lot in the book, the, the way we imagine the nation is also the way we imagine women and family. And it's, it's the case all over the world. It's not only, you know, post-colonial or, or, or in the Middle East. And also, uh, uh, I mean, another very important, I think, theoretical point is uh, the importance to break the, the global local boundary or dichotomy. And, and I think that my, my analysis or what I'm trying to do is to shift the unit of analysis from, you know, talking about, you know, the local versus the global uh, to relations and processes across borders, basically, uh, of these so-called cultures uh, defined by nation, ethnicity, race, class, sexuality, etc. So instead, again, of the middle class, Eurocentric, neoliberal frame of the simultaneity of women's oppression, uh, uh, transnational feminism proposed that feminist analysis should be grounded in the histories of neoliberal post-colonial nation state projects. Um, and maybe some of you are familiar, familiar with the work of Chandra Mohanty, Ella Shahad, Jackie Alexander. Um, and I think it's also a reflection on what Ella Shohat called the dialogical encounters of, uh, of differences that define relational analysis uh, that I think is, is something that um, encompass intersectionality but also uh, push it even further, um, saying that it would address the operative terms and axes of stratification typical of specific contexts, along with the ways these terms and stratifications are translated as they travel from a co one context to another. So the idea is to look at different positioning vis-a-vis -vis histories of power and showing the co-implicated, and that's very important, the co-implicated histories and communities. And I think that this is also what Edouard Glissant, maybe some of you are familiar with his work, uh, Caribbean uh, francophone uh, uh, um, intellectual and uh, uh, scholar and poet as well. Uh, I think this is also what Edouard Glissant uh, uh, means when he's talking about le tout monde. So uh, when we think of the words feminism, the, the term women's rights, uh, I think that complicating uh, the lo local versus global simplistic dichotomy is really essential, showing that what is perceived as global is often very specific, right? When we think about you know, international solidarity or global, global feminism, for example, uh, or, or you know, ideas of rights, women's rights. 
uh, or woman of the world. Um, I think that critical feminist approaches question the category woman and the notion of sisterhood in, in many different contexts, right? And often what is perceived as local, right, is the result of transnational, transregional dynamics. And I think, uh, I hope I'll make it clearer when, when I talk about more concrete things. <laughs> um, and uh, I try to apply this critical feminist perspective as, again, a, a method. And this is why ethnography is so central in my work. And it's also because maybe I came to sociology through Pierre Bourdieu. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, very, I'm very much a qualitative you know, and an ethnographer. Um, so through the ethnographic moments uh, uh, in the book, um, uh, what I'm saying is that describing the place, the space, the environment where you know, an interview with a women's rights activist is taking place is as important as the interview itself. So for example, when I interview Iraqi uh, uh, woman activists or civil society activists, uh, describing the electricity cut in the middle of a discussion, describing the checkpoint and the T-walls that you have to cross to reach for example, a demonstration. Also de describing the explosion happening, for example, when I was inter interviewing activists of Rabat uh, al-Mar uh, al-Iraqiya, the Iraqi Women's League. Uh, I mean, their office happened to be uh, just next to uh, the Najat church, and it happened to be the day when an explosion and, and a terrorist uh, attack happened there. This describing all this, including it in the analysis, you know, organically in the analysis, you know, is as important as, you know, the discursive dimension that you get when you do an interview. So uh, what I try to do is to provide a wide historical perspective, starting at the very formation of the Iraqi modern state, um, and you know, engage with detailed, his detailed history of women's social, economic, and political experiences. Um, so I spent a lot of time throughout a period of two years, uh, when I was uh, living mainly in Baghdad, um, inside the women's movement, observing, participating to women's groups and initiatives and campaigns. I did it mainly in Baghdad, but I also did it in Erbil and Slemani. And more recently, since 2016, I expanded my, my fieldwork to also male activists, male civil society activists uh, in the South. So Nejef, Kufa, Karbala, Nasriya, and, and more recently, uh, Al Basra. And so uh, what I'm going to talk about uh, rely on more than 85 uh, you know, interview, semi-structured interviews, uh, half of them uh, consist in life stories with women activists from all social, ethnic, religious, and political backgrounds. Uh, and I started every single interview uh, or conversation with women social and political activists between, they were between the age of 21 to 74 years old, and, and, and the activist uh, um, um, who was 74 years old when I interviewed her passed away just a year and a half ago. And I, uh, I started with this question, So what made you become a woman's rights or a feminist activist? And from this question, you know, and from the hours of conversation arise uh, by this question, I have gathered a transgenerational oral history of women's social, economic, intellectual, and political lives in, uh, uh, in Iraq since at least the 50s. Um, and I think uh, uh, another theoretical point that I want to make, maybe a final, and then I'll jump into talking about more concrete stuff, um, is that I consider my research as the produce of uh, collective thinking, you know, resulting from the interviews, the discussion, the time that I spent with activists. Uh, because I consider the activists as primary theorists of my work. Uh, if we understand theory as an attempt to make sense of, right, if we reconceptualize the ways we do ethnography, the way we do, you know, the, the way scholars actually produce knowledge. So instead of the very Eurocentric or positivist or individualized and I would say neoliberal way of producing knowledge, if we consider that the people that we are studying, right, are the primary knowledge produce, producer, then the research process starts to be very different. And I think this is really the contribution that critical feminist approach did to scholarship, right? Starting in the 70s and maybe a little bit before, actually. Uh, um, that really questioned the way we defined ourselves as scholars and, and you know, redefined the way we do, uh, uh, the way we do research in general. Um, so. All right. So just to give you a brief historical overview of um, maybe the argument I'm making around the relationship between uh, 
issues of women, gender, and feminism in contemporary Iraq. I argue that in the colonial period and the old early colonial period, that was, uh, I mean, uh, that started in the, the British invasion where the, is in 1917 uh, and you know, until the late uh, 50s, women and gender issues were shaped by different power struggles involving, involving competing ideas of nationhood and definition of states uh, and struggle between social and political forces such as uh, an emerging urban middle class, the ulama, the tribal sheikh, and very importantly, the emerging emerging women's movement or feminist movement. And in colonial Iraq, the formulation and context of this qadiyat al-mar'a, the woman question, were really marked by both the marginalization from power and the tribalization of the majority of Iraqi society. Uh, so colonial Iraq was led by a politics of uneven differentiation in terms of legal rights that created a fragmented citizenship and nationhood. And as the scholar Noga Efrati uh, argues, the British really tribalized Iraqi women, di differentiating the regimes of rights between urban and rural. Uh, so uh, tribal laws uh, for uh, women outside of the cities and religious courts for uh, urban women. And it's very interesting when you, when you think about the way actually uh, uh, you know, the colonial uh, period really fragmented the notion of citizenship because I think that really it's a similar dynamic that happened after 2003. Um, so I think that the best example that can be used to understand this relationship between these different notions is actually the personal status code, is to you know, think about it and analyze the way it has evolved and the way feminists have mobilized around it. And not only feminists, actually, I mean, uh, diverse political forces. So the personal status code is also known as uh, the family law. Uh, uh, so it's the main legal frame based on uh, so-called Muslim jurisprudence or fiqh and adopted by many Muslim majority states at the time of, time of their independence from European imperial uh, powers. And this code gathers uh, legislation regarding so-called private matters, but we know that the private is political, so it's not that private, such as marriage, divorce, uh, child custody, inheritance, so effectively most of women's legal rights. Um, and what I argue is that the personal status quo uh, represents a field of struggle between uh, different social and political groups. So the state uh, that wants to dominate the narrative on you know, the nation, the ulama, uh, tribal leaders, political movement, and uh, uh, the women's movement. And in Iraq, uh, it's a very pro-women's rights uh, personal status code was adopted uh, after uh, the, the revolution in 1958. So it was established in 1959. And it was one of the most progressive in the region. And, and the most revealing example is the article on inheritance. Uh, uh, the personal st status code granted through an indirect mechanism almost equality in inheritance. But of course, the article was abolished in 1963, uh, right after the first Ba'at coup. Um, and so I think that the, the Iraqi personal status code, and, and it's very important to understand that, to understand what is going on now. Uh, it represented two things. Uh, first, the inclusion of feminist activists in the process of negotiating for their rights uh, in a context, very importantly, where the political culture uh, was dominated by the anti-imperialist left. So somebody like Nazih ad uh, uh, who was a, um, a communist activist and a women's rights uh, activist, a feminist activist, prominent figure of uh, the League for the Defense of Women's Rights, uh, she participated to the drafting of the personal status quo. So feminist activists basically participated to the negotiation around you know, uh, their legal rights. Um, and it, very interestingly, unlike other countries, so in Iraq at, at, uh, you know, during this period, there were two competing trends of feminism. There were like the national nationalist feminist, you know, way more conservative, uh, close to, you know, uh, or related to a male political nationalist figure and the communist trend. And, if, and, and Iraq is one of the few countries where actually it's the communist trend that was dominating the political scene. The second element that is absolutely essential in this personal status code is that the text of this law uh, was, uh, inspired by different uh, schools of fiqh or religious uh, jurisprudence, um, uh, gathered uh, Sunni and Shia fiqh. So basically, it's, it's, a, it's a unifying uh, legal frame uh, that um, is applicable equally to all Muslim Iraqis. Um, 
So, I mean, th th there would be a lot to say about, you know, the way the personal status code is really revealing of um, the debates, the post-colonial debate around indigeneity and, and you know, authenticity and, and uh, you know, how come that, of course, uh, the, the only field of rights uh, that is not completely secularized is the field of women's rights, etc. So it's definitely, a, you know, a post-colonial uh, gendered uh, um, uh, issue. But I'm, I'm, because of time, I'm going to jump to the 70s. <laughs> uh, and so this is what happened in the 50s and 60s. And, and I mean, the way basically the personal status code was, uh, uh, if you follow the way it has been reformed, you really follow, again, the articulation between issues of gender, state, nation, and, and, and religion. So it was um, reformed again, uh, um, despite the fact that you know, the authoritarian Ba'ath regime was uh, increasingly uh, authoritarian. But despite that, uh, feminist activists were able to push for even more progressive reform in the 70s. And their efforts were supported by full employment and the regime ideological narrative at the time that you know, promote, promoted some kind of a pro-woman secular socialism. So, but however, by the mid 80s, with the country at war with Iran, the women's movement was reduced to the General Federation of Iraqi Women, which really became a mouthpiece for uh, the Ba'ath ideological turn into a very more conservative you know, discourse regarding family and gender issue. It's a period, so the 80s, it's really the period of ec uh, economic weakening of the regime that really concentrated its budget to the war efforts. And so women were invited to basically go back to their house and, and give birth to future soldiers of the nation. And this is when actually there is a very famous uh, discourse of uh, Saddam uh, uh, that says that a good Iraqi woman is a woman that provides five children for the nation. So you see the turn in politics, you know. Uh, but of course, after the 90s, you know, the Gulf War, uh, this pol the politics of so-called state feminism witnessed a dramatic re uh, reversal. And of course, this period was marked by the political and economic weakening of, of the, the, the party. And we need to recall, and I think we need to recall that every time we talk about uh, Iraq, is that the pro process that you know, we have witnessed after 2003 really started in the 90s with uh, the six, week of, uh, six weeks of devastating US-led bombing you know, of Iraq by the US-led coalition you know, following the invasion of Kuwait. Uh, um, and the, of course, the decade of severe, really criminal uh, 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 UN-imposed economic sanction sanctions. So post-91 Iraq is a country where the middle class is plunged in poverty uh, with really destroyed uh, infrastructures. Uh, some report talks about the fact that after the six weeks of uh, US-led bombing, the country was brought back to a pre-industrial state, right? Um, and it completely ru ruined its social, educational, and health systems, right? So after, uh, um, I mean, once reputed, uh, Iraq once reputed as the country with the most educated woman, a home of one of the most developed and effective uh, uh, higher education system in the region, Iraq in the 2000s, so after the, the bombing and the sanctions, uh, had one of the highest rates of illiteracy and inf infant mortality. And the dismantling of the education system, the public se sector and state services uh, as a result of sanctions had you know, di direct impact on the everyday lives of the society and of women, of course. So uh, um, Yasemin Hassan Jawahri, for example, in her research on the impact of, of the, the sanctions on women, uh, noted that the emergence of new forms of patriarchy in extremely impoverished uh, uh, context you know, uh, happened. And of course, at the time, again, the Ba'ath Party as well aligned itself with the rise of political Islam in the region. Uh, uh, there was you know, Hamla uh, al-Imaniya, so uh, the face campaign that was launched by, 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 by the party. It's the time when uh, the Allahu Akbar was added to the Iraqi flag, if some of you remember this period. And uh, so uh, additional, and, and again, the personal status code was reformed uh, in a way that was extremely regressive. So for example, it is, and it's still the case today actually, uh, it is during this period that the Basque re regime imposed a mahram, so a male relative for women to travel. And it's still, it's, uh, it's still the case when I arrived uh, in Basra, uh, as a woman alone, I couldn't actually uh, uh, book a room on my own because I didn't have a mahram. So, but this is not only you know, the result of the post-2003 conservative, etc. dynamic. It's actually started in the 90s. 
So really the US-led invasion and occupation of Iraq in 2003 has exacerbated the social, economic, and political crisis in which the country has been plunged since 91. And it has really framed it in uh, ethno-sectarian lines. So post-2003, uh, the post-2003 context is marked by the institu institutionalization of communal, ethno-sectarian, ethno-religious identities uh, uh, by the US-led administration and really the extreme weakening of the state through a campaign that was called the debasification campaign, uh, uh, aiming to basically uh, um, um, basically pull out uh, the, the Ba'ath Party from, from, from the state. So um, the invasion and the system it imposed on Iraq plunged the country into an ethno-sectarian uh, war. Uh, I mean, if you think about it, you, you can put it differently. It's, it's a way to basically institutionalize racism, right? So to put in place a system based on uh, communal identity. So you, don't, you can't exist politically uh, if you don't define yourself through your ethnicity, your religion, or your sect, right? You can't basically you can't exist politi politically outside of these lines. So, uh, and I think that also the, the the vacuum left by the disbanding of the army uh, through the debasification campaign uh, was rapidly filled by armed social and political groups, very sect uh, uh, sectarian, very conservative, and also very corrupted. Um, so the result is that we experienced in two thousand and six and two thousand and seven an incredible. Um, um, cycle of violence. I mean, uh, I think we had something like more than 1,000 people dying every single week in Iraq between 2006 and 2007. And this has, of course, reshaped uh, the whole, uh, I mean, if we think of Baghdad, it has reshaped the whole city, but it has really reshaped uh, uh, the whole uh, um, uh, public sphere, the whole social uh, social life and political life in Iraq. So, if you look at the pictures, uh, at the picture here, I'm going to show a few. Uh, this is a Rashid Street, which used to be uh, uh, the street where my mom used to work, and it used to be a very beautiful street, the heart really of Baghdad. Um, so, if you look at this picture, this one as well, this one too. Um, you can clearly see that Baghdad, so the capital of, of Iraq, you know, um, is today a city of men. Uh, although now there are, you know, less checkpoints. When I was there, I mean, I think they are, uh, now, now you can circulate way more easily than at the time when I was doing fieldwork between 2010 and 2012. Way less, uh, you know, T-walls, etc. Uh, um, but you can still see ar armed men at every corner of the street, right? And women pass, circulate for specific purposes, but men really occupy the street. Unemployed men, impoverished men, maybe you can see it more clearly here. Um, and women who are visible in the streets are uh, these women in black abaye, begging. They are often widows, often coming from the southern region, uh, who had their husbands or, or sons killed in you know, one of the wars. Uh, so what you also see is the lack of infrastructures, right? Uh, uh, that is the result of state collapse, or collapse, or would say state destruction after 2003. That, of course, started with the sanction, but was completed in 2003. So no public services. You see the public spaces in the city in complete disrepair. Um, still, even in the capital, limited, limiting, uh, uh, limited access to running water, limited access to electricity, especially outside of Baghdad. No development at all since 2003 of any form of infrastructure. Um, um, absence of a health system, absent, I mean, uh, an, a very bad education system. I mean, no improvement on that. Uh, uh, all of which, you know, women in society rely on to live a normal life. Uh, and in contrast to that, you have this. <laughs> so the incredible rise of, uh, so this is Al Harthiya Mall um, um, of the private sector. So this is, you know, part of what happened since 2003. Everything is privatized. Water is privatized. Electricity is privatized. Health is privatized. Education is privatized. Um, so this is this is Mall Baghdad uh, or Mall Al Mansour. So there are, of course, spaces for, for the emerging middle class, places to socialize for youth and family who can, you know, who can afford it, basically. 
so post-2003 Iraq is this incredible imbalance, this uneven country where access to resources are limited to a small, conservative, sectarian, ethno-sectarian elite supported by its militias and armed groups. So, um, and it's very important for me to start, uh, I mean, not start, but to talk about, uh, you know, uh, Iraqi feminist and, and, and women's rights activism, starting with this, you know, to help you, you know, get a picture of, of, of you know, the context that shape, you know, this activism, militarization of everyday life, uh, um, social and economic violence, and the rise of social and religious conservative forces that dominate both the state and the streets. So to go back to the personal status code situation, uh, this is a demonstration in uh, Sahat al Ferdows. Maybe some of you, I'm pretty sure that you remember this. You know, the thing there is where the, the state statue of Saddam, <laughs> it didn't, you know, it, well, you remember these images. We won't talk about these images. So you see that nothing has replaced it, you know. And this is uh, um, the 8, 8, uh, March 8th, International Women's Day, 2012, this picture. I'll, I'll show more recent pictures. I mean, actually, I show, I'll show pictures of this Women's, uh, women's Day. Um, so this, uh, this was also organized uh, in order to protest um, against uh, another reform of the personal status code. So basically what happened in 2000, uh, since 2003 is that again, you know, the change of you know, political scene uh, 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 impacted directly on the personal status code. So the Shia Islamist political parties that came to power with the US-led uh, uh, um, coalition forces uh, pushed, the f one of the first thing that they did when they arrived in power is to actually question the personal status code and propose to actually abolish quite a progressive still personal status code uh, uh, that relies again on both Sunni and Shia jurisprudence and put at its place a sectarian personal status code. So a personal status code for it, uh, each community, basically. So there were different uh, attempts in 2003, in 2005 in the Constitution, and more recently, maybe you, you heard of it, the Ja'fari law, which is, I mean, the, the Ja'fari law, um, the name is, it comes from the Ja'fari Madhab, madhab uh, or school of law, which is the, the main school of law in, in, in Shia Islam. And one of the, the articles in, in, in and this Ja'fari law was, for example, uh, because the Sin al balagha so the, the age of maturity in, in Ja'fari jurisprudence is for girl is nine years old. That means that it would allow the marriage of girl as, as early as, as young as nine, year, nine years old. Whereas the legal age of marriage for both uh, uh, men and women is uh, 18 years old in the personal status code. And also it, it would allow, uh, allow different kind of precarious mar marriages where women have a very few legal protection. Uh, so women's rights activists were protesting against, you know, the Jafari law, uh, um, you know, that is really considered as a, history, a historical uh, gain and achievement, you know, from feminist activists. Um, and so the Iraqi Women Network, the main independent platform gathering women's rights activists, as well as uh, the Iraqi Women Journalist Forum, this is one of the things that they were using. Uh, the, the, also the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq, many civil society activists, you know, uh, criticize the sectorization of uh, uh, women's legal rights in a context that is marked by social and religious conservatism, sectarian, ethno-sectarian politics, political instability, and also the absence of a strong unity fine state. So we see really that gender issues are raised and debated in a context of contested nationhood. That is to say that through women's rights and visibility in the public space, the struggle around Iraq, Iraq's identity is really played. Uh, in a context where gender norms and relations have been structured by militarization and the rise of social and religious conservatisms. Uh, in which I think the nature of the Iraqi state is really central. Um, and, and this is why I think the issue of the personal status code, we understand that it's not strictly a gender issue and it's not strictly a sectarian issue. It's, you know, what's, uh, and I'm going to use the term uh, defined by Maya Migdashi, who works on Lebanon, a sectarian issue, right? So, um, and now, um, I mean, I'm going to talk a little bit about, uh, I don't know how long do I have... Oh my God, okay. I'll take 15. Uh, so. Okay. 
started. We started a little bit late. So um, another very important thing that I want to talk about is uh, the notion of injurization of women's rights activism. So um, first of all, I mean, it's important to note that women's rights activists since 2003 have been really acting as substitute for the lack of state institutions and services. So really supporting women and families' everyday survival. They have been vocal in asking for healthcare, allowance for widows, mobilizing against institutionalized corruption, etc. However, their activism has also been very much shaped by the networks of donors and funds that they can find. Especially in the first years following the invasion, the new colonial discourse, you know, that we all heard about saving Iraqi women, bringing democracy, you know, of the US administration, resulted in a huge investment of um, um, women-related or civil society initiative. So in the first years following the invasion and occupation, millions of do dollars were given to women's groups, uh, uh, you know, by US agencies, but also UN programs such as, you know, UN Women, uh, UNAMI and international NGOs. So the type of activism, the programs, the campaigns and activities chosen by women, even the vocabulary used by many women activists have been deeply influenced and shaped by you know, this network of funds and financial support that they receive. So the focus is really, you know, and it's something that is applied all over the Middle East and, and maybe in, in so many other contexts. You know, on the CEDAW, talking about the CEDAW, uh, insisting on democracy mainstreaming, you know, teaching Iraqis how to vote, uh, gender mainstreaming, empowerment, uh, and political participation, right? Uh, we had a huge discussion on the issue of quota and the new constitution uh, include a quota of 25% uh, um, of women in, 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 in um, assemblies, in, in, in representative assemblies. Um, and of course, for women, it is difficult, if not impossible, to refuse these fundings, right? Or to exist outside of this funding because, you know, the state is, uh, uh, and it's interesting because when I started my fieldwork, I realized that even uh, uh, women representative, like uh, women MPs, preferred relying on international funding than asking the corrupted ethno-sectarian state. So women did a lot of democracy and human rights training, etc. But they did also a lot of really grassroots, you know, helping society to survive a kind of work. So what we see is that the US-led invasion in the country, uh, intervention, sorry, in the country since the 90s led to really a collapse of a state provoking the loss of basic survival resources. But then uh, uh, considered that it has brought democracy, right? Because Iraqis have the right to vote. <laughs> I mean, technical, basically, and notions of rights and freedoms have been privileged to actual rights, the right to live in security, the right to access to running water, to electricity, the right to education, the right to have a decent job, a decent place to live, to healthcare, etc. And this is uh, um, what, oh, this is a demonstration uh, this is a year and a half ago against Jafar law in El Mutanabbi Street. Um, and this is um, uh, I think that the, the context following the invasion of, of ISIS has really exacerbated, you know, uh, this, and, and it has also uh, pushed very much activists in the street. So, um, um, a movement of protest, a protest uh, 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 you know, was launched, and its slogan was, uh, it started in 2011, but I think it really uh, took shape after the invasion of ISIS. Uh, the, the, main, the main slogan in, in 2015 was, Bismiddin Bagon al Haramiya. So in the name of religion, we were, rob, uh, we were robbed by uh, uh, thieves, basically. And it expresses really the rejection of the use of religion by you know, the conservative ethno-sectarian elite put in power in 2003. Uh, um, and the questioning of the regime itself, right? So the focus is really on Dawla al Madaniya, so asking for a, um, a civic state, uh, um, demanding welfare state, uh, equal access to resources. And, and many women activists, so you have here, uh, it's the period in 2016 when activists actually uh, organized tent in front of the green zone, you know, which is the zone where uh, all the, uh, the, the Iraqi state administration as well as the US embassy is, and it's completely you know, uh, separated from, from the, 
some what what some call the red zone, the rest of Baghdad where people actually live. So and and, and these are women's rights activists. You see Hana Edouard, Hana Hamoud, Emel Bashi, women from the Iraqi Women Network. So women activists were really participated actively in this movement of process. They emphasized the importance of linking gender equality advocacy with the struggle for religious and, and class equality. They really, I think, formulated a very intersectional relation kind of 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 the of, of um, uh, um notions of, of feminism. And, and I think that these mobiliz mobilizations that started uh, again 2011 and 2015, uh, and it always started every single time uh, um, after uh, a young man was killed in Basra. It always started in Basra after a young man was killed by security forces. And then uh, uh, it took, uh, you know, Tahrir Square and, and, and it reached, you know, uh, all, of, all of the country. And I think that these mobilizations have really radicalized, in a good way, <laughs> women activists and pushed many of them to go beyond the NGOized notions of rights and demands to actually do demand more radical things, to, to you know, tackle a more radical questioning of, of the status quo. But however, uh, the war on terror is really used to uh, repress these movement of protests. So for example, this, this um, uh, the, the, the picture is from uh, February 2017, where actually pro-government thugs uh, entered the demonstration in Tahrir Square, uh, uh, and, and you know, uh, 10 people uh, died and hundreds were, were wounded. And it's really through this narrative of the war on terror that actually this, this you know, form of uh, independent uh, uh, activism is being uh, silenced. Uh, and more recently, more radical protests. So this started in the summer, um, uh, last summer basically. Um, and again, it started. And this is a picture that is, you know, that speaks a lot. That uh, I think summarizes the situation in Basra. So in addition to experience, Basra is the place where 80% uh, of the state oil resource is, you know, extracted. Uh, but in addition to experience a shortage, of, a shortage of drinking water and electricity, as well as a high rate of unemployment, ba ba Basra also suffers from pollution, sanitary and health phenomena such as the prolif pro proliferation of, of cancer. And I think that the notion developed by uh, my colleague Omar Diwashi on the toxicity of everyday survival is really something that is applicable to Basra and maybe the whole country. Uh, um, so, and this spontaneous movement of protest uh, that you know spread in the whole Shia South. Um, its slogan is even more radical than the previous one. It is uh, no, no to parties. <laughs> so no to the political establishment, basically. And uh, the last elections uh, in May, uh, maybe some of you followed what, uh, I mean, it was described, it's crazy. Even scholars describe these elections as peaceful power transition, you know, as a proof that Iraq is a great democracy. Uh, and Whereas these elections have only further institutionalized, you know, the militia and the various armed groups that participated to uh, the war against ISIS, and until today, the assassinations. Maybe you, you you've heard of um, uh, Suad Al Ali or, or Tara Faris. So until today, assassinations and kidnappings of activists, journalists, individuals who express dif di divergent political opinions. Um, uh, you know, um, is something that is uh, justified under the name of, you know, the war on terror. Um, and while the protest movement of 2015 was, I would say, co-opted by the Sadris movement, which is an important uh, uh, Shia movement, uh, this is a picture of uh, women um, uh, in Basra, it was taken last September, basically, and it's it's I think uh, the only day way where uh, one of the only day when we could visibly see actually women uh, uh, participating to uh, uh, the protest in Basra. Um, there is another picture here in Karbala, and, and and I've interviewed the women who actually uh, organized this um, demonstration, and it's interesting because. Um, as the, the protest movement of 2015 was really co-opted, um, the protest that we are, um, uh, that is going on since uh, uh, last summer in Basra, is is really a men's movement. Uh, uh, it's, it refused also any form of formal organization, and it's interesting because if you look at, what, I mean, what is written and and what I, I heard from, for example, the women who organized this demonstration, they said that we take the street to to uh, express our solidarity 
with our brothers in Al Basra, and there isn't any kind of feminist or gender related, uh, you know, concern. I mean, in a way, it, it is a feminist thing to say that we 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 are expressing our solidarity with our brothers. But uh, uh, you know, the activists who organize this protest, you know, also express the fr frustration in the sense that it's a men's movement. Um, and um, I don't have the time, I guess, to talk about uh, also in the context of, you know, um, of all the discourses around sexual violence uh, that happened after the invasion of ISIS. Um, um, women's rights activists have been working on um, drafting a law that would sanction domestic violence. This law exists in Iraqi Kurdistan, but it doesn't exist uh, uh, in, in the rest of the country. And they have been, you know, organizing, but they have been kind of two, two kinds of activism, um, uh, the, the, the non-NGOized, I would say, a, a more radical form of activism developed by the Organization of Women's Freedom in Iraq that refuse any form of partnership with the state and really insist on, on uh, who actually run its own shelters for women victim of abuse. And there is another kind of, of activism, which is more the Iraqi woman network activist that is in dialogue with UN women, UN program, etc., that is trying to open a dialogue. I mean, it's very interesting because there has been a, a really historical uh, moment when in a year and a half ago, feminist activists met with Al Marja'iya, so the Al Hawza, which is the, the Shia religious authority in Najaf. And I think it's a, it's a historical meeting, you know, between feminists and, and religious leaders. So, what act, uh, the activists are trying to do uh, is to find people to talk to <laughs> and find people because they completely lost hope in the states. Uh, uh, um, knowing that the state is weak and that you know militias and armed groups are, are way stronger than the state, so they are basically trying to negotiate with religious authorities to uh, adopt uh, a law that would you know sanction uh, um, uh, domestic violence or family violence. So. Uh, this is one of the meetings, and this is, just to end up with something nice, uh, this is um, uh, eight, uh, March 8th of uh, this year, so uh, this is El Mutanabbi Street, um, and so this is the, uh, the International Women's Day gathering, and in this picture it's, uh, I mean, you don't know the activists, but I know that it's, it, it was nice because I think it really gathered the two trends <laughs> of activism, the more NGO-wise form of activism and the, and the, the, the other form of activism. So this is uh, activists of, uh, uh, the Iraqi Women's League, the oldest woman organization uh, in Iraq that was funded in, um, in the 60s. Um, and this is, uh, in the afternoon of this day, uh, this is in Tahrir Square. So, I mean, you can see that the numbers are very limited. That is not a huge movement. Uh, so the, the, they, they have organized a campaign called uh, Adha Haq. So you see that there is really an emphasis on uh, legal rights. So she has rights, basically. And this is Ofi activists. So they were in the same space. It doesn't look like it. It's the same day. They were in the same space that they were. And, and so it's interesting because you see that uh, the Iraqi woman uh, network activists would use, you know, terminologies around haq and, you know, rights, whereas, uh, whereas ooh, Ofi's activists would, would uh, rather prefer notions of musawa, equality. And perhaps I'll end here. Thank you very much. Twenty twenty-five minutes, and why don't we gather like a couple of questions, yes. maybe, and then give you the chance to answer, and then two more in the interest of time. Okay, Emily and Puya. Yes. No, please. All right. Um, I'm just curious about, in terms of personal safety, how does that work with being a feminist activist relative mm. to different parts of Iraq and various militias and forces? Mm. Yeah. Oh, okay. So my question was about the Jafari code, about the age of, you know, when it, marriage is allowed for, for girls, I guess. Yeah. Um, and I, I was curious to know because oftentimes um, uh, the more Islamist types mm -hmm. argue for such a law because they say that, you know, by marrying early it prevents, you know, premarital misconduct and stuff like that. and mm -hmm. it, 
you know, once we once we create a system that's in harmony with our history and our culture, it's only then then and only then we could be stronger. You know, they use that discourse that you know is the import, importation of foreign ideologies that have that weakened the Muslim world. And I want to know, like, if if your interviewees um, address that attack on feminism as a Western construct that was there to subvert Muslim culture, and or if they frame their um, discourses using you know, an Islamic paradigm to make it more palpable mm. to, or, or more acceptable to such, con or, yeah, to such, you know, people. Mm -hmm. Yes, great question. Mm -hmm. I, want to answer now. Yes. Uh, I mean, in terms of personal safety, I mean, yes, thank you for, for this question. I mean, um, the reason why I think it's it's really important to insist on the context, uh, and and the reason why I I, I talked a, a lot about uh, um, the institu institutionalization of you know uh, armed groups etc. is that I think it really you know shaped shapes what is possible and what is impossible, you know, to say or to be or to do, you know, uh, for, 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 for feminists in Iraq. And of course, you know, throughout the interviews uh, that, that I have conducted and throughout my work with, with feminist activists, I noticed that there are so many things that, you know, can't be said because people don't want to get killed. It's as simply as that. Um, and, and, and this is why, you know, when, when, when you think about uh, this whole notion of democracy, you know, what is, what is democracy? I mean, what does it mean? Is it, you know, to actually be able to vote every five years? Uh, like, is, is this really, uh, you know, some type of, of a freedom? Or, or is it, you know, to be able to uh, express? I mean, for me, democracy is first, first access to resources, for sure. Uh, but but even, even, you know, talking about Iraq as a democracy is a very problematic thing, you know. Because uh, if you criticize, if you, for example, um, mention the name of one of the head of, of one of the militias that is uh, very powerful and that became even more f powerful after the war against uh, ISIS uh, uh, in the north, uh, you, you will need to probably leave the country. And, and what's going on in Basra, for example, is that the movement is, itself is becoming extremely violent, and activists themselves are receiving a lot of violence, right? Uh, justified uh, under the name of, 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 of the war on terror, or justified under uh, many things, or you know, they, they can, could be you know, accused of being Ba'ath associate or affiliate, or, or could be accused of, of, of you know, uh, being pro Daesh, for example. I mean, it's. Uh, so, so it's definitely something that is important, uh, and, and uh, feminist activists, uh, I think, negotiate, uh, you know, try to cope with the reality as as um, as much as they can. Uh, so, in in limiting them, themselves in what they say and in where they go as well. Um, I remember uh, uh, um, um, Yanar Mohammed, the activist of Ofi, the week when there was a week um, uh, a few months ago when uh, we had like four uh, women who got, I mean, they got killed in broad daylight, uh, one in Basra uh, and, and three in Baghdad. And I remember that uh, um, um, activist of the Organization of Women's Freedom um, was really scared for her life, right? So, uh, for example, the shelters uh, that, uh, that they run, uh, nobody know, uh, uh, you know its, uh, its address. Some women activists choose. And for a very long time, um, and that was really very interesting when I started my field work because Although Baghdad is really safe now, uh, I mean, it depends on what you do, of course. But um, uh, for a very long time, I remember uh, when I was um, uh, meeting activists or, or wanting to go to uh, um, women's rights uh, offices, uh, um, I, I really had to be in touch with the people you know, on the phone because the, the name of the organization would not appear on the street. The, the offices of the organization would be the kind of a normal residential house. Uh, it's less the case now, honestly. It's, it's really less the case, uh, but um, but I think it's it's really revealing uh, of you know what is possible and what is what is not possible. Now, uh, I mean, this is such a great question. So thank you so much uh, regarding uh, you know this this discourse. I mean, um, the the last chapter of my book really uh, um, break down all the different kind of feminisms that uh, uh, exist in Iraq. And um, 
I engage in in you know in these uh, conversation around um, and in, even when I did the interview and when I was debating with with Iraqi feminists, uh, of course, I, I, uh, there is something that you know exists in so many contexts. This all uh, self orientalizing, you know, saying that no, our culture doesn't allow us, and if it's not our culture, it's our religion doesn't allow us. So. Um, what I do at the theoretical level is that I break the secular versus religious binary in saying that essentially, uh, um, even if you say, I mean, what's the difference between saying our religion doesn't allow us and our culture doesn't allow us? So, for example, a secular person would say, or a so-called secular, whatever secular means, would say it's our it's our culture that doesn't al al allow us, and a more perhaps religious person would use religion. But at the end of the day, it's the same argument, right? It's a form of you know self essentializing, you know, thinking that you know culture is something that is that doesn't change, right? And it's always, of course, and you you are so right, it's always against some kind of Western, uh, you know import we uh, we are not like western people you know uh, we we know what a woman is and and we you know we're not like these european or these american women but what is really interesting i think in the case of iraq is that well actually it is these western people who brought the shia conservative islamist <laughs> in power in 2003 right so this incredible contradiction that i always you know discussed with uh, islamist women activists uh, you know that came to power in 2003 through the US led invasion and occupation so um, I was like so you came with El American you came with the Americans and now you're saying that you your model or your values are a kind of a, a response or, 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 or against you know uh, Western imperialism it doesn't make sense right so there is this contradiction that is incredibly interesting to analyze right um, uh, and I, th I think that yes so there are different forms of feminist activism. There is one form that I would uh, call uh, human rights feminism that is really like the kind of NGO eyes. And, and also something important that I noticed when I did fieldwork is that uh, the enjoyization of activism is something that happened across uh, women's organizations groups, so either um, secular or religious. So the CDAO, the you know the the gender empowerment, the Re resolution 1325, all this terminology uh, is something that happened across uh, you know women's quota, women's political participation. So really, on these terms, there is no difference between you know Islamist or secular activists on these terms. They're all using the, these kinds of register uh, of rights. So I would say that this exists. There is the more um, uh, let's say. Um, a form of activism that I would identify as a Muslim feminist in the sense that it does engage with religion and say, and I think it's actually um, a form of, of uh, engagement with religion that breaks the West versus the rest. Because saying that you know religious is actually something that is fluid, that is changing, that can be reread, uh, um, opens horizons of, of thinking thinking that goes beyond this uh, dichotomy. So there are women who definitely engage with this kind of work, women who would be uh, or are interested in what, for example, Musawa, you know, a Muslim feminist, transnational Muslim feminist network is doing, but. I would say it's, it's, it's tricky, you know, because what kind of Islam are we talking about? Are we talking about the Shia, yani, uh, um, Shia fiqh, Sunni fiqh, what Sunni, what Shia fiqh? So in, in, in a society as complex and as religiously sectarian, like so diverse uh, uh, in its approach of religion that is Iraq, uh, it's, it's the Muslim feminist kind of narrative is, is tricky, I think. But I think that because the personal status code relies on religious re jurisprudence, many feminists, for strategic reasons as well, not because, I mean, some of them because they care, but many of them because, <laughs> not because they care about religion, but they have to care about it because they need to uh, uh, use it as an argument to uh, push for a more progressive reform of the personal status code. Um, and there is also um, another register of, of, of feminism that I would say is more, um, more radical or, or more uh, that would, like there is the equivalent of, uh, you know, leftist form of feminism or Marxist form of feminism that uh, relates uh, uh, equality, class equality to, you know, gender equality. So all these forms of feminism exist, but I would say that the human rights feminist, fem feminist uh, kind of activism is the one that, you know, dominates for the reasons that I have explained, the, the investment of NGOs, etc. Uh, 
Yes, ma'am. I've got a question as far as the um, more rural uh, people. Uh, obviously, all the protests are happening in your uh, cultural hubs or industrialized hubs and whatnot, just like they do here in the States and everywhere else in the world. Um, one thing that uh, we've seen on the DOD side is that we would send out uh, female engagement teams because they would be, their whole purpose, it was an all-female unit, and their whole purpose was to go in to try and, um, I guess, do those basic human rights uh, checks, whether it be health checks or various female products that they may need in education, and uh, et cetera. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, we've left Iraq, and they're continuing that hopeful progress in Afghanistan, but what is, uh, is there anything that can or is being done to make sure that those that are on the outskirts of the country don't get left behind? What is a DOD, sorry? Uh, military. Oh, all right. <laughs> sorry. Oh, military, okay. But, I mean, I guess these, these groups that you are talking about, the female teams, were part of the military. Yes, the it, military it was a group the, of all yeah. female Marines, yeah. uh, and then yeah. later on the Army adopted. And their whole purpose was to um, basically, rural areas are not going to talk to men because they're not allowed to. And the men aren't allowed, aren't allowed to talk to women at the time. So we would send in uh, teams of 25 to 50 females specifically to go and teach, educate, and make sure they're OK. Make sure they're doing and, it. And these women are American women? Yes, ma'am. But this mm. happened in Afghanistan. Did it's, this happen in Iraq as well? It's currently happening in yeah. Afghanistan. And, yeah, and yeah. I, they started back in 09. But my real question is, yeah, what is being done question? to make sure they don't get forgotten? Right. Um, well, I mean, I, I, have to, I have to reply in, in, in really insisting on um, the structural dimensions of uh, um, of violence, right? Uh, in the sense that uh, I think that um, what happened—I mean, what happened in, uh, through these interventions—is that you really provoke structural, uh, incredible economic, social, and political violence, and then you send people to give human rights training and and to do health check and whatever. And you think you are helping women, and 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 you are supporting a society. So, yeah, this would be my answer. I don't know how to answer. Uh, I wanted to talk, I guess, about the word fragmentation uh, mm. in, your, in your title, and uh, and the question of the nation of Iraq itself. Um, and for the women that uh, were activists in general that you're talking to, um, how many of them, you know, sort of see Iraq as something to uh, to maintain? Mm -hmm. um, and how many of them, uh, especially in a context in which there are different kinds of voices saying Iraq is is an impossible construct, mm -hmm. is a colonial construct, mm -hmm. is better replaced with some other some other entity? Yeah. Should I take another one? Yeah, let's take another one. Uh, okay, mine's very different, uh, officially. Um, I was actually curious about the proliferation of materials, the kinds of discourse that's proliferated between these groups, what kind of access to materials do people find, and mm -hmm. how do they communicate with each other, yeah. either like digitally or in person. I'm mm -hmm. actually most interested in whether or not there's a lot of digital communication in Iraq, mm -hmm. especially as within other countries in the ME, we see a, mm -hmm. a movement towards like, the, the, the loneliness of, of the digital era and the ways in which we communicate with one another. Mm. Okay, thank you. Um, the way, thank you for this question, yes. There is such a huge literature on Iraq. This is the white man political science literature that I was mentioning at the beginning. In that talk about Iraq as this thing that actually never really exists, that, okay, why not having actually three, go back, you know, to, to the Ottoman period where we have Wilayat al-Musl and Wilayat al-Basra and Wilayat al-Baghdad, yeah. And there are so many scholars that actually participate uh, to, you know, uh, to actually strengthening this idea. When, when we see that, uh, as any other place in the world, uh, 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 notions of, you know, uh, citizenship and nationhood and, you know, uh, um, uh, national identity is always something that is, you know, debated in, in any place in the world. So why is uh, Iraq perceived as this non-real 
reality when 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 this kind of of uh, contestation of, of of you know who is a good citizen or and also a questioning of, of what is citizenship is happening everywhere and no I think that if you look for example at uh, the work of, of Sami Zubaydah uh, um, and, and, um, and the work on, on, on my work I would say <laughs> you, you really uh, see that I think in the 50s and 60s through uh, through um, um, at the political scene I would I would say uh, through the left there has been a, you know, a unifying notion of what it is to be Iraqi, but always a multiple form of Iraqiness, right? Uh, um, we are a country, I mean, like Syria, we are a country that is so incredibly multiple, right? Uh, uh, Iraq is a place, I mean, in certain cities, for example, in Kirkuk, uh, until, I mean, uh, uh, and since it's always maybe, Arabic is one of many languages, right? And so many Iraqis, you know, speak uh, so many languages, right? And I think that, the, you know, what happened in 2003 and what is also happening in the scholarship about post-2003 um, is to deny this diversity, this multiplicity of what it is to be Iraqi and summarize it through, well, there are Kurds, there are Arabs, Shia and Sunnis. <laughs> this is Iraq. Right. So we need a Kurdish region. We need a Sunni region, you know, in the west of north and west of the country, and and we need a Shia region. Well, Iraq is not that, and and but Iraq exists in the imaginaries of, of activists. And actually, you know, if I, if you if you look, for example, at, at some of the pictures, what you see is. I mean, in a way that we need to also problematize and analyze, you know, the Iraqi flag, the use of the Iraqi flag all the time in every single protest. And, and the use of the Iraqi flag has been, you know, uh, debated among activists. Uh, uh, um, I've interviewed uh, the activists who uh, organized the first uh, um, main demonstration in Tahrir Square in, in 2015 uh, uh, um, after Muntadar um, al was killed in Al Basra. And they were saying that when they were organizing the demo, you know, some groups wanted to use, um, for example, um, uh, uh, flags of a, of a certain political group, or, and everyone was like, no, we want the Iraqi flag only the Iraqi flag so I mean I think it's interesting uh, that there is this reappropriation of of course I mean you know nation state is something that is you know very problematic from a sociological point of view right maybe also a political point of view um, and and the fact that uh, for activists is very important to say that you know uh, it's for Iraq it's uh, and, and this imaginary is 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 extremely important for them so so this yeah would be my answer and um, um, Maybe it's, uh, I can also uh, um, answer uh, your question in, 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 in talking about the way um, online, you know, uh, 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 like social media uh, feeds into and the circulation of different forms of knowledge and contradiction actually forms of knowledge and imaginaries of nation is circulating within uh, uh, social media. Uh, activists in Iraq, as anywhere, they use, uh, they use Facebook. Facebook is a big thing in Iraq, more than Twitter, actually. Um, Viber is a big thing, too. <laughs> WhatsApp is very new. <laughs> it's been just a few years that we use WhatsApp. And interestingly, what happened uh, uh, when the protest is in Basra started to emerge, so huge, so powerful, is that uh, the government cut the internet for about you know 10 days 2 weeks uh, you know to 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 uh, make sure that uh, the internet is not used uh, i mean because uh, uh, the the government was completely afraid it was terrified but by wh what was going on and, and and cutting you know the internet was a way to uh, you know um, attempt it didn't work attempt to uh, lower the participation of uh, uh, to the demonstration um, but i think it's um, this is an important topic because i really notice in, that there is a generational gap in iraq happening uh, the 2003 is all these terrible things but it's also the end of the sanctions and it's the opening of satellite channel for the first time in Iraq and, and, and the, the entrance of the internet in Iraq. So there is a really an incredible, and I see it through my fieldwork with young activists, an incredible generational gap. Uh, so the people, I mean, the, I see it, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm in my early 30s and I see when I, when, I, when I talk with people in their 20s, 
I feel it, right? The way we use social media, I'm barely using my smartphone, right? Uh, and, and the way the younger generation has actually, it's the thing that they know. I, I think I had my first email box when I was 18 years old, maybe. I don't know, I don't know for, for some of you. Uh, some, some young people have always had an email and a Facebook account, right? And, and, and I think that many talk about the opening of so many horizons with you know, the, 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 the entrance of the satellite, satellite channel and the internet. So many words, and it's true, Iraq was so isolated before 2003. Now people can travel, for sure, people can travel, people travel through, you know, these satellite, satellite channel and internet, uh, you know, uh, like a social network. And, and so this is something that uh, I think needs further uh, analysis. How exactly, you know, uh, does it, you know, shape people thinking? Uh, there is a lot of work that has been done on, on the impact on satellite channel on, for example, uh, transnational um, Islamist network, you know, through certain religious channels. Uh, and, 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 and I think that um, there is also so much work done on the ways in which, uh, uh, you know, ISIS, for example, use have you know use Facebook and YouTube etc. So I think more work n uh, need to be done, and, and we need to reflect on the way young people and you know people from um, uh, and the older generation uh, um, use use uh, um, these these means of communication. Great. I think we need to end here, but maybe they can come for Q. Yes. Thank you.